Now, Dr. Rodney uh, and me were involved in activities that the government found was threatening, and uh, we were more or less supposed to die the same way. At least that's what these Secret Service guys told me. And um, my problem was that I wasn't doing what Rodney did, going to the country and start a political organization and trying to win elections or overthrow the color or what. I saw Grenada was knocked up, and I felt Guyana was next. So I started to position myself that in case there was this upheaval, I could rise to even form some kind of, be a part of some uh, temporary organization, then I could have, you know, uh, spin off and gone and started my own party and, and, and campaign um, for the presidency of the country. So in the interim, I was visiting the American Embassy in Port of Spain. I had not been able to see the ambassador. Um, he made it clear that he don't want to see me because he know that I'm, I don't have nothing really going and uh, it's useless. And he was right because going to the embassy in such an open fashion, you can't get anywhere with it because the Trinidad government informed the Guyana government and the Guyana government and the Trinidad government had special trained guys on my case 24-7. Now, um, I was lucky to um, get in touch with two people in the embassy, the uh, political advisor and the economic advisor or attache economic and political attache. The names were Hernandez and Highville. Um, those are the only things I can remember the names right now. And so I visited the embassy maybe about eight times. Uh, the last time I went there was uh, when the Challenger had crashed. Um, I took some condolences cards, but it got very dangerous because a guy who was on my campus uh, showed up and he was blowing steam out his nose and the guy, the security guy, delayed me much. Uh, getting this guy on, on and he was like, you know, go for it. The guy was supposed to shoot me there and um, then they would have covered it up, get rid of the whole body and that would be the end of it. But I was studying at a uh, college in front of that and so, and again, the government sent over a whole bunch of, I don't know the number, but a whole bunch of different uh, guys, some studying, some in the community, some barbers, all kinds of stuff. This barber guy, he said, man, I'm Guyanese and I do barbering over here and uh, I would like you to patronize me and so forth, but let me know when you come in. I could prepare for you. No, I don't understand that kind of stupid stuff. So one day I showed up. I said, bro, uh, I have some time off now. Uh, I want my hair cut. He said, oh, my, you should have told me you were coming. He said, just a minute. I got to go and get something. I said, no, man, I'm busy, bro. Let's get it done. So he decided to cut my hair and he cut my neck. A small cut. It was bleeding. He said, oops, I cut you, man. He said, you know, I have something at home that I could put on this and it would heal it real quick. Um, l let me go and get it. It's okay, bro. I mean, I've had my neck cut several times, you know, cut in here, having my hair cut, and so on. So, it was no big sweat. And um, others were, um, I used to drive taxi also. They joined the taxi and want me to go like, oh, we're going into this alley way up at the back. So, um, we're going to look for something up there. Um, how much you charge us to go in there? Man, I don't go in there, bro. Um, <coughs> this guy, who I think was the leader of the operation, uh, we were in the same class. We were doing the same courses and we had the exams at the same time. So he told me one day I was driving a taxi in the area going up to the college back and forth. So he said, uh, here, man, I have a, an important meeting up on campus. I want to go real quick. I said, look, that car is going right now. Go with him. No, no, I want to go with you. I want to patronize you, your fellow guy needs. So he waited and I sat in the front seat. So he said, you know what? Don't get anybody going past the college. He said, um, you know, we got to go real quick. So the, I took people, the last who would stop a mile away from the campus, about a mile away. So after I dropped off the last person, I see him relax. Well, he was putting on his seatbelt from the start. So I said, no, don't put on your seatbelt, bro. Don't put on the seatbelt, man. He said, no, it's safe on the whole line. Don't put on your seatbelt or else you got to go. Okay? Because my intention is that I don't know who he was about. I had suspicions about him. I, it wasn't clear to me what was happening, but I knew something was going on and he might be a part of it. So, uh, if he had tried anything, I mean, I'm sure I'd have run the vehicle into the mountain and, you know, it's like, uh, he would have got badly hurt or uh, injured. So, <clears throat> when we reached up to the guy, I sped off. So, when we reached the campus, I said, okay, go. He said, no, 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 let's go back down. I said, wait, I thought you had a special reason why you want to come here so quick. Go ahead, man, go. Just go on, bro. Here's the money now. Just go on with it, man. Um... What else they did? Oh, they wanted to go swimming. They said, man, you know, we must charge you and take us to the beach at night, man. It's the best time in the beach. And we have the beach for ourselves. Nobody there and so forth. <laughs> kind of stupid stuff like that. You don't go to the beach at night. 
I mean, except you got some nice little lady you want to go and, you know, uh, get in some calisthenics. But other than that, you know, you, you go to the beach in the day. And I can go to the beach with all these guys. I mean, they were surely going to drunk me. In fact, they even told me once how to do stuff. Some guy was giving burden problems. They had to get rid of him. They took him, took him out and, and drunk him. Held him on the water for like five minutes. And took his clothes, folded nice, put it on his uh, bicycle, and left it on the wall. So... Uh, when the parent, his people start missing, they're even going on the radio and announcing this guy is missing anybody has information, yada yada. Oh, look, we found his bike by the seawall, by the beach. Oh, maybe he went swimming, maybe he's drunk. You know what I mean? Uh, that's how I gonna happen. That ain't happen to me because I don't trust nobody. I'm not going anywhere with nobody or nothing. I was working in a gas station. I was robbed several times. So one of these guys, he said, man, you know what? You must get a gun, bro. Put it in that barrel over there. And anytime they rob you on the move, you just go out and gun them down. I don't want nothing to do with no gun. Because it's not about a bandit trying to defend yourself. They come and find me in a gun, say that I'm planning something, and then they'll find a note and all that stuff. So, you know what I mean? I'm just watching these guys. Now, finally, they, um, this guy, his name was Alan Chichester. You, I understand he was a lieutenant in the Army. He was in the Air Force, flying a helicopter. And for religious reasons, he was having problems with the Army. So, the president signed his dismissal papers from the Army. Or the Navy or our Air Force or whatever. So he joined my church. Uh, I mean, yeah, joined the church, and this led to him being laid off. Uh, so the church felt like, oops, we gotta have this guy. So they gave him a scholarship to go to college because they didn't want him to fall. He's a big boy, he's a military guy, he's an officer, and he, for Jesus' sake, lost his job. So we need to help him up. So they sent him to college. But they knew what was happening because they'd be dropping hints at me. And they didn't suspect that this guy was a part of the operation. Because it looked so far away, he was flying far away, maybe in the, uh, but maybe 50 or 100 miles away from the capital. And then he had this problem, and then he comes to town and he sent him over. So they were talking about how this guy was such a stolid work for the Lord and all that. And he's come to college and so forth, and, and oh, he's a good man. So when this strange guy showed up on campus, I said, hey, Alan G. Chester. He heard his heart. He said, hey, how do you know my name? So he felt the CIA told me about him, all right? Because although they know that the CIA wasn't dealing with me, or from their observations and their surveillance, there's nothing, no white person, no nothing happened, nobody contacted me or anything. They still feel that some way they could get something in. So he won't know if the CIA told me, I said, no, them boys are talking about you, man, and so on. So he said, oh, okay. Now, in the early I said, let me surround this guy and see what he's about. So the next night I said, look, bro, um, the hospital is opening, the prime minister and all the people, the big shots going to be there. I'm going to take you over and, and introduce you to some of these people. And I'm going to, you know, give you a, a tour around the place and so on. So he said, no, it's okay, man. I have time. I'm going to be able to get into all this stuff. I said, no, let's go. So I took him to where the prime minister was. But when I reached there, I see that everybody's focusing on him. And they're smiling and he's smiling back. So I said, like, damn, this thing looks strange. They seem to know each other. And he just came. How is it that the prime minister and these bodyguards and all these people know him? And they're smiling like, oh yes, got him, mm -hmm, yeah, right. After we left there, I took him up on the mountain, overlooking Port of Spain, the capital of Trinidad, and say, see how beautiful it is over there, look at that. And he's coming out to the vehicle, very professional. Now you're studying theology, and you believe in the Jesus, and he's baptized, and he's saved, and all this stuff. I mean, it's like, you got to get out of that military stuff, and you start to have trust in somebody, because I had no intentions of harming him, or anything like that. But he's watching me, and he's making sure, and so on. And um, I see cars pulling in, and I say, you know, this is time to go. So I said, let's go, man. Jump in the car, and we're gone. I'm taking back the taxi because it wasn't mine. He said, look, when you almost reach where you're going, I want you to tell me. I said, well, I'm swinging off the road, you know, to go through here. He said, oh, drop me off here. I said, no, man, I can't drop you off here, bro. You're new to this island. I leave you here, something happened. I have a problem with that, bro. So he said, okay. I took him in. He said, okay, when you're near to reach the house, tell me. I said, well, the next house is it. He said, stop me right here. I said, come on, bro. I want to introduce you to this man here, bro. So I introduced him to the owner of the car. This is a lieutenant guy. He got baptized. He lost his job. And he studied theology. He wanted to be a minister. And yada, yada, yada. Now, hadn't I done all of that? This guy, because when he was going into the car, he's asking the guys, he's saying, how I look, bro? They say you look good, man. Everything is good. He turned around. So apparently he had a weapon, a, a pistol in his, in his waist at the back. And he was asking him whether it is conspicuous and whether it's being seen or not. Um, so 
I mean, he was going to shoot me straight up. And then, of course, the police in Trinidad would have covered it up and it would have been like, no problem. Um, so uh, these are some of the things that are happening. And um, the Trinidad government also was doing things. I recall one night uh, the police decided to rob me, but they were going to shoot me, okay? So they are going to shoot me, so they are going to take the money and then shoot me. I had almost a thousand dollars in my pocket. The boss said he must have like 50 bucks in your pocket, but I, I said, no, these guys robbing this place, they need some real money or else they're going to shoot me and I ain't going to go for that. Because if I have 50 bucks and they rob the place, he say he lost 600 bucks or a thousand. So he's making profit on the robbery. So I'm going to have enough money now to make sure that these guys can be happy. Okay. So the police pulled back. Uh, he said, look in there. So they went around the block and they came back. So he said, come out from the back there. I was during rob during the summers. Uh, you know, I was working during the summer. I was rob. So I went over the street, out to the gas station, sitting behind a, a cart. So when I came out, he came out and said, give me the money. So I, I had like money in all my pockets. So I gave him some of this. I gave him from the next pocket. Him from the next pocket, from the next pocket, I had six pockets of money. It was like five, six hundred bucks a hand. And he's holding it in his one hand, he had his rifle in his hand, and the other one had a, a long knife, like a matchup. He had a cop. So the guy said, No, no, no. But he's just, I'm just giving him money. Here's the money, here's the money, here's the money. And while giving him money, a car pulled in. And uh, I told the guy, I said, Hey man, go ahead and sell yourself. I'll be coming just now. The guy from the community. So uh, he said, Man, why are you bothering the guy, man? This guy is out here at night helping us to get gas late at night. What was the problem? So you see, you're all Trinidadians, you're alone, mind your own business, you know? Uh, you're all my own business, and that's what you don't fall the Trinidadian. So that saved me. Another time, right at the gas station, a guy busted my head. It's the same part of the Rodney kind of situation the guy in the government trying to get me. This guy busted my head. I went to the hospital. Um, they put me in a back room. And uh, it happened maybe at 1 o'clock. I'm in the back room. I'm bleeding profusely. Then a woman is coming every now and then. And she's moving the scab and taking out paper and wiping the wound. I said, it's bleeding more. So I asked him, I said, could I get some water? They say, I'm um, just now. And I already started to feel bad. I lied down now. And uh, then a friend of mine who was a nurse, she said she was at home and she had this premonition, she couldn't rest, she had to come to work, although she wasn't supposed to come to work, and she came straight to where I was, and um, she, I said, she said, what's happening here, man, I said, this guy busts me head, and I'm here, they won't even attend to my woman, and so forth, and I really need some water, so she went and got me some water, um, got them to come and, you know, sew up my wound, and that's, that's how I escape. Miracles, God is good. Um, so, Rodney died because he was too trusting and naive. God protected me to a great extent. But then, I used my kind of common sense. I mean, I'm not going to take nobody for the word. I, I love you, I trust you, but I got to verify what you're saying. And if I see a pattern, I don't want to hear. I don't want, this is why I don't want, I want no friends. I move alone, I don't have no problems. Police can't come to arrest him and arrest me and then take me and bust my head. You know, so if Rodney were like me, I think he would have been alive. The better thing would to be is to stay out of politics because there's no way you could get these fellows, man. They rigged the election straight up. So even if you win, you lost. You know what I mean? So why even try? As I said, I was going to hope, I was hoping that or expecting that America would overthrow the government and then it would have been easier. But it didn't happen and so I never got there and so I didn't die.